Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Uh, so, um, I was just explaining how to some friends of mine, like, never try give two talks at a conference. It's just the worst idea. Um, so, I, I did something really dumb. I didn't back myself, so I submitted two talks. And then the bloody organizers accepted both of them. And, and the problem is one of them is like, a, I had to put more effort in because it's the keynote. So this is like the runt of the litter. So I'm completely fine if you need to leave. Okay. So uh, what this talk is about, it's a technical talk. It's not, it's not like the, the keynote. And it's not even really a security talk. So I'm extra okay if you want to leave. Hello, no problem. Um, all right, so uh, one of the things I'm really interested in is optimizing stuff, making it go faster. And I'll explain some of the reasons why. Uh, so this talk is about optimizing hacking tools. And uh, I really like Rust, so that's why there's a crab on there. So people who know Rust know why there's a crab on there, but just to explain it, because there's like a crab on every slide, and you might not get the joke if I don't explain it. Rust people call themselves Rustations. It's like crustacean. And that's why the mascot is a crab. So that's why I've got crabs everywhere, not because I have some weird thing for crabs. <laughs> okay, so like, just one of the greatest hackers in the world is this guy named Hal Varflake. Uh, he kind of invented large swathes of the reverse engineering field. He was one of the original founders of Google's Project Zero after Google bought his company, uh, Bindiff. Um, and he's just done amazing stuff. Like, have you heard of the Rowhammer attack? Yeah, that was him. Obviously, there were other team members. So his real name is Thomas uh, Dulian. This is Dulian, right? I've only ever known him as Halvar Flake. He once explained why he is called that, and I don't remember. I don't remember. Do you remember? It's a Viking comic. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, there was a Viking comic called Halvar. But was he called Flake? I think the Flake is a... Yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. Least important part of this. So what's interesting about Halvar, apart from the fact that he's, he's this really excellent hacker, is he left the information security industry to get into the uh, performance optimization industry. So he built a company called Optimize with a Z, and it just got bought by Elastic. And uh, it was really interesting, he gave a talk at QCon earlier this year where he spoke about his reasons. And he talked about three reasons that resonated with me. So, uh, sorry, to be clear, what those reasons are, are why would you engage in performance work and leave security work to do it? So the first is what he called the death of economic Moore's law. So if you're familiar with Moore's law, it's this idea that the number of transistors doubles roughly every year. The economic impact of that is that computing power gets cheaper. Now, realistically, your Amazon AWS bill is not going to be $200 next year if you ran the exact same workload on the exact same systems. It might be a bit cheaper, but it's not doubling. So while we are still kind of in a place where Moore's law is holding true, we're not in a place where the economic benefit is, is coming out. So what that means is workloads need to be optimized, or phrased another way, optimizing workloads has a meaningful economic benefit because you can't just rely on things getting cheaper. Um, the other side of it is that hacking provides this kind of full stack view of computing. You're not a front-end developer or a back-end developer. You're not limited to one part of the stack. You get to kind of hack across everything. If you can move from the front-end through to the back end, that you'll do it. Uh, Haroon, who's one of the early people at SensePost, once said, uh, security is just a career of constantly going deep. You find something, you go deep all the way, and then you move on to the next thing, because you're just moving through the stack the whole time. And performance gives you the same opportunity, because the performance optimizations could be at any, any layer. So you get that same kind of hacker joy, because you can deal with large code bases and move across full stacks. And then the last part, which he experienced certainly a lot more than I experienced, nobody asks me to write cyber, cyber weapons, um, is that a lot of the work he was doing on the security side could have significant implications on the health, safety, and security of people. Uh, and sometimes you can write vulnerabilities, you can discover vulnerabilities or write exploits that end up with somebody being dismembered in an embassy somewhere which is a really unpleasant outcome from some of this work, uh, the spy versus spy aspect of it. Whereas with performance, you don't have that problem. Plus, with security, like no one will love you for the work that you did. They'll just be like, okay, thanks for calling my baby ugly. I guess I can go fix it. 
at the best part, but at the worst part, they'll be like, I'm gonna sue you, pew pew. <laughs> but with performance, everybody loves you. They're like, oh, sweet, this is faster and cheaper, great, we'll do that. And it's got other benefits like the environmental ethics. So, yeah, it was, it was interesting to me that there was this very influential person, certainly in my life, saying these things at a time when I was getting quite excited by it. Uh, the reason why I focus on performance, um, slightly different but somewhat related. So the first one is, uh, I used to work with a guy named Marcus Lavero, he's now at Thingst, and he once told me good hackers always do two things at once. So when you're hacking into something, you've got some long-running thing going on in the background while you do something. The simplest example would be you're running Nessus in the background or some kind of web application scanner while you're manually poking at things. But there's lots of opportunities where you can write something long-running, even if it's shitty, just to be gathering information, which might help you later on. And in security, pretty much every vulnerability can be discovered or exploited through a brute force. Whether that's the right thing to do is a different story. Whether it's the most, it's definitely, it's never the most efficient. But this like time, time effort trade-off exists all over the place in security. So writing brute forces and being able to make them go fast can be very beneficial for discovering and exploiting security problems. That's kind of the whole premise behind fuzzing. But pretty much all vulnerabilities fall into the you could find them through fuzzing um, category. Uh, then uh, it just improves, the more you learn about this, the more your code gets better, which is quite useful. Like it's not something that you do once off in one place and then it's, it's useless. It's something that you can keep reusing in lots of other places. Uh, for research purposes, looking for excuses to go deep, this gives you great ways to go deep. It's slow, why? Can it be faster, why? And then you end up in computer science and physics problems, and that's interesting. And it gives me the same kind of hacker joy uh, that I get when I'm exploiting, exploiting bugs. So maybe it'll be interesting to you. Okay, so now I wanna get into the optimization part. So there's two, kind of two parts to this talk. Maybe you're noticing a theme. Uh, the, first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, like how I optimize. And the, the optimization I'm doing is you know, command line applications for hackers. So some of you are probably developers who are very good at optimizing large workloads across Kubernetes clusters. I don't know how to do that. Um, and some of you are probably very good at writing programs. I'm, like, I'm, I'm sort of sitting at the intersection of doing a bad job at a lot of things, but maybe it's enough of an overlap of some of those things that's interesting to you. And then the second part of this is I wanna talk about uh, some specific problems that I faced while writing an NT password cracker, which I thought were kind of interesting. Maybe you would too. Okay, so let's get into an optimization primer. That is Donald Knuth. Donald Knuth is a famous computer scientist. Maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't heard of him, but he's built just like a ton of stuff that computer science relies on. And way back in 1974, he had this famous saying, premature optimization is the root of all evil. So when you're optimizing something, the first trick is to not optimize and just make the thing work. Because if you try too hard to optimize it in the beginning, you end up in all sorts of difficult situations. And you also then can't improve cleanly from like the worst case. So just write it, it'll be fine, and then you can develop a benchmark and improve on that. The next is what kind of benchmark do you want to develop? So large majority of the time, real computer scientists are looking at like optimizing CPU load, optimizing in kernel time, optimizing memory, there's all sorts of things there. I'm just interested in optimizing runtime. I want this thing to go as fast through the time, or they call it wall clock time, the time I experience in the real world. Um, that's what I'm optimizing for. That's not really something a lot of real optimized people seem to, to focus on, but things like CPU and memory are a, a way to get into that. So the benchmark I'm gonna develop most of the time is how long did it take? And then you can use profilers to try and figure out why things are going slow, but you kinda need to do some work beforehand to understand what the hell the profile is saying, and then you need to do some work afterwards to understand why the hell the profiler is saying that. And then you need to do a bunch of fiddling, much like in hacking, you might have a hypothesis, but the actual hacking is when you're sitting there and iterating and fiddling and not sure why, and trying to figure out why when you made this change that happened. So you do a lot of that to then try and work out uh, what kind of changes are happening in the profiler and why. So let's go into a simple example. If we have, uh, this is the problem we wanna solve. If I give you some string, we want to create every permutation of that string. You can kinda see the, the benefits from a password cracking perspective here. 
Okay, so if we want to write a program to generate that, I'm going to write the simplest possible program. So it's in Rust, but I've tried to keep it simple, and you don't really need to understand too much of it. So I'm just, you see the thing in brackets, the 0 dot dot 10, so I make a range, um, because it's Rust, that's actually 0 to 9, uh, and then it's creating permutations of length 10. So it'll say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, et cetera. It's creating a whole bunch of permutations there. So I'm not using ABC because it needs to run long enough to, for my computer to actually do something meaty. And then I just got a very simple for loop that goes through and prints them out, and it uses the default debug pretty printer to do that. Okay, so this is going to be the premature. I'm not optimizing this thing. There's no premature optimization, uh, and I want to see what that looks like. Okay, so I'm using a tool called Hyperfine. You're gonna see this a lot. Let me explain what you're seeing there. So Hyperfine, written in Rust, irrelevant to this point, is a way for timing how long something takes when it runs, and it's pretty good at comparing the speed of that against other things. So you'll see some switches there. The first one is W, so that says warm up. So it does two runs where it doesn't do timing. It's just running those so that your computer warms up its caches, puts things in memory, all of that kind of stuff. Otherwise, you have this problem where the first run is always slower than later runs because of it. Then R is the number of runs to do because you have to watch how long this takes. I've made it three, but you, know, you can probably make it higher if you're doing this in real life. The L switch is, is complicated, but we need it for later. So this allows me to run lots of versions of this and compare the speed against them. I'm only running one thing now, so that doesn't matter, but later it's gonna matter. So I define a variable called variant and I only give it one, which is a-vanilla, so I've got a directory called a-vanilla, which has the first version of this code that I just showed you in it. So it runs it. Okay, then it gives two lines of output. The second green thing, on the, so 3.164, that's the mean time, so the, the, the run which was the most average of the runs. So that's a pretty good one to look at to understand how long this thing actually took. And then underneath, you've got the minimum, you've got the maximum, you've got how much time it's spent in kernel, how much in user space. But mostly, we just care about that one number. Is my cursor? Oh, good, my cursor works. So that's the number we're going to look at for most of these things. All right, so we wrote the simplest possible version of this code to generate these permutations, and it runs in three seconds to generate all of those permutations, 3.1 seconds. So how do we make it faster? Now, you can try and fiddle a whole bunch of different things, but generally, the first thing I do is I add a buffer. So buffers are a really good way to make sure that two things that don't match their producing and consuming time uh, can go a little faster. That's not why this buffer is working here. I'll get into that in a moment. So what we've done with this code is we've, it's the same code as before. We've just added a string called buffer, unimaginatively. There it's generating permutations in the same way. It's looping through them in the same way. But what it does is it's writing the permutation to the string rather than to the screen, and then it checks once it's bigger than a certain size, it prints that out on the, on the screen, and then it clears the buffer. Okay, so we're just adding a, a buffer into it. The reason this works here is because the cost of writing to the screen is quite high, so by only writing to the screen, writing a lot to the screen rather than lots of little things to the screen ends up with a bit of a performance speed up, and I'll show you in a bit. Okay, I should have gone to that slide because I'd helpfully highlighted all of the bits I wanted to show you. All right, so now when we run this, we want to compare it against the first run. So I'm running the original one again, and frustratingly, you're going to have to feel those nine seconds it takes to run. Well, no, there's the warm-up too, so 12 seconds, 15 seconds, adding threes. Who knew it was that hard? So now that feels really slow. Okay, then we run version two, and you can see it's much faster. So it's at sub one second, it's at 884 milliseconds is the mean time. So we managed to dramatically increase the speeds, 3.58 times faster, by just adding a buffer. Wonderful. Okay, so we did some fiddling, some premature fiddling, we got some speed ups, that's great. I'm not saying the solution to all optimization is add a buffer, but a lot of the times it is. Uh, and you might, maybe there's programmers in here, and you go, well, that's really obvious. But for the rest of us, you go, well, I mean, like, am I just dumb? Do I not know these things? And I wanted to point out that it's not that obvious to everyone. So this is Atom, the guy who created Hashcat, arguably like the most prolific speed up optimizer on uh, modern computers when it comes to hacking tools, adding a buffer to his version of Permute uh, because it made it go faster after we had an argument on Twitter. 
<laughs> and you can see the first version was committed in 2015, and then there's his buffer update in 2019. Okay, so that was kind of poking around, getting lucky, but hopefully gives you a taste that you can make things go much faster. You can live much more of your life not staring at a computer screen because you made things go faster, up to 3.5 times with just one buffer. I hope you're buying what I'm selling. Next, we're going to use a profiler. Okay, so flame graphs are a type of graph. I'll explain what's going on here a bit, but you can enjoy the ChatGPT generated crab on fire. So flame graphs are a type of graph. What they show matters. So flame graph is a whole bunch of things that are children of parents sitting on top of the parent. Wow, I'm explaining that badly. So it's got the parents at the bottom and the children going that way. The children generally take less time than the parent. Uh, now, flame graphs can be used for memory, they can be used for on-CPU time, so what you're, what you're displaying matters. A flame graph doesn't always show the, the same thing. So in this case, I'm using cargo install flame graph, if you're a Rust person, the default flame graphs, which shows kind of on-CPU time. The number of samples uh, that showed it to be in a particular stack frame. And what you can see here is that for our buffer version, the vast majority of time is spent on core format debug format, which is a child of format write. So even though we added a buffer and it went a lot faster, we've still got the majority of our program time spent writing, writing to the screen. And when we look specifically what it's doing, it's when it's calling the debug formatter, formatter to take a bunch of integers and turn them into a string and put them on screen. Okay, so that gives us an idea of where we should focus to see if we can make things go faster. Okay, so what Yes, this is the part where it's using the, um, the debug formatter. And what I did is I changed it. So instead of calling the debug formatter, we take each integer and we turn them into a character directly and we stick that in the string. So now we're not asking more complex things to happen. We're doing the one thing that is needed. Take a number, turn it into a character, stick it on the string. And that's what that's doing there. It's otherwise exactly the same thing. Uh, and at the end, we put a new line in. So it goes through each character there. Okay, so let's look at how this compares. Was it 15 seconds? I should press start on these things sooner so that we don't have to physically wait for 15 seconds. But I wanted you to feel the visceral pain of how long and how irritating three extra seconds, unnecessary seconds needs to be on running this thing. But I also definitely should have clicked next sooner. So let's just wait awkwardly. Okay, we've passed that one. All right, so this is our second one, which we know ran in about just sub 900 milliseconds. And our last one, we're down to 169 milliseconds just by getting rid of the formatter. So that's at nearly 19 times faster than, than version one. At this point, I think we're at like six extra lines of code to make it go, go faster. Okay, so let's go back to our profiler. And now the crab is smoking instead of being on fire. Huh? Just uh, high quality. And when we look now, there's not a lot of things happening. It's getting a little tighter to look for our optimization advantages, but it's spending most of its time doing this iterator. Iterator next, things like that, rather than spending most of its time writing to the screen. So that tells me the actual iterations, the permutations rather, are what we need to optimize next. So uh, I mentioned that argument with Atom on Twitter. Uh, and I first put something out here when I was fiddling with this, and he's like, oh, you might want to look at this. And then it was this passive-aggressive pastebin thing about how shit my code is, how amazing his is. And I was like, oh, thank you, 10% faster. You know, it was really cool. But inside I was seething, and I'm a very competitive person by nature. Um, so I went to go look at his code, and he uses an algorithm by somebody with the best name in the world. So I'm going to pronounce his name and not say anything rude. His name is Philip Paul... Fuchs. That's how you say that, right? That's how you'd say it? Yeah. Mr. Fuchs. So Mr. Fuchs is a PhD, uh, and his website that he created about this algorithm looks exactly how you would expect a website created by a computer science PhD about an algorithm would look. Uh, don't let that distract you, though, from the fact that it's super interesting. So this is the pseudocode from his website about what it does. It doesn't matter. What matters is somebody wrote him in this question as part of a practical he was doing for one of the courses he was given, and he sat down and he thought about it, and he went, well, we can make permutations much faster without recursion and all sorts of other things, and he created this fantastic algorithm called QuickPerm. 
Uh, so Atom was using QuickPerm for his version of Permute. So I thought, okay, let me use it, and I implemented that uh, into, into this thing that we're creating. 15 seconds, and then five times 900 seconds, and then how long did the other one take? 169, five times actually. So how long is this whole process gonna take? How long do I have to fill the air? 15 minutes. No, oh, okay. <laughs> You're banned from answering any future questions. <laughs> okay, so we implemented quick perm and we're now down to 13 milliseconds, 13.7 milliseconds, which is 231.23 times faster than our original version. So that's great. That was, that was fun. Was that kind of exciting? Was it, I thought it was kind of like this. This gives me a little bit of a thrill. <laughs> and like the worst part, and I told you I'm competitive by nature, the worst part is that when you compare this against Hashcat's permute, his is still faster. It's 9.9 .9 milliseconds, like reliably, and mine ranges from like 10 to 14 milliseconds, and I honestly don't know what to do next. So the code is on the internet, if you want to make it better. I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Thank you, though. And I really look forward to the, the, the PR on the repository. <laughs> Um, yeah, so github.com, what is the repository? github.com slash singe slash fast dash permute. Uh, it's there. Yes? You said yours was less consistent, but the standard deviation here is 10 times higher. Yeah, mine is less consistent because my standard... Your standard deviation is much lower. Uh, you're right, you're right. Ha! Huh, take that, Adam. <laughs> No, so because this runs really quickly, you should actually run it like 100 times. Uh, and I think I was doing this, so you can see what time at night I was doing this, and I was on battery, so it's not like ideal test conditions, but you're right. Okay, so in having played a lot with these various optimization things, this is kind of the hit list I put together. So when you're optimizing stuff, what should you look for? So the first is the algorithm. You saw what a dramatic speed up that gave us. Now, it doesn't matter what order you do this in, but the algorithm can make a bit, fairly big difference. So think about what you're doing, you know, all that big O notation stuff that you ignored in computer science, maybe just me, um, but that turns out can make a big difference. Then the other one is network communications. Network communications are kind of the slowest, much slower than your local I.O., so being able to optimize that stuff makes a big difference. Hackers do lots of things over HTTP, so you know, using chunking, using HTTP2 streams, all sorts of things like that can get you quite significant speed ups. Uh, then your local read and write I.O., understand where things are blocking, where things are going slowly, and we're going to spend a bit of time on that. Uh, the language you're using, I mean, I did a lot of things in Python because that was easy, and then Python is slower than a compiled language. So you go to a compiled language, and then the compiled language is slower than your Python because you just wrote the code wrong. Anyway, it's a, it's a cycle. But spend some time thinking about you know, what language you're using, how it works for what you're doing. Maybe there's a domain-specific language which could be useful. Maybe there's some really fantastic compiler optimizations in LLVM for that specific problem space you're using. It's totally worth looking at those things. And then people talk about this a lot, but it's also worth looking at memory allocation. So the less time you spend needing to clear large swathes of the heap to put things on it, uh, the faster things will go. So for example, with the buff, um, the no-string version of the, the quick perm thing, we needed to create a vector, we needed to put a whole bunch of stuff in there, we needed to call the formatter, that, those memory allocations are slow. By just sticking characters straight in the string, we didn't need to allocate any more memory on the heap. We're just filling existing allocated memory. A lot of the time people think threading will make stuff go faster. And a lot of the time threading doesn't make stuff go faster. Or you end up with concurrency problems that makes it not work better. Um, so, like, use threading right at the end. And part of that is because you need to understand this problem well enough to know, like, where your actual blockers are and then figure out if multiprocessing or concurrency is going to be actually, actually beneficial to you. Um, and sometimes it's not. Like, if you're I.O. bound, then having more process power isn't necessarily the thing that's going to, to save you here. If you're memory bound, then having more processing power is not the thing that's going to help you here. And then, like, unless you're much smarter than me, so pretty much all of you, um, like, concurrency is really hard. It's really, really hard. And then from a performance point of view, all of the synchronization needed across concurrent programs can make things really, really slow, which is why pretty much all of the time the first version of a threaded thing I write is slower than others, because I've got some kind of state 
blocking problem introduced in there. And the reason I say this is because pretty much everyone does threading first, and then, then you have a lot more complex code uh, that's going slower and you don't know why. Okay, so this, this is now a theme. This is what this talk's actually about, much like the one earlier today. It took me half the talk to get there. So I got this laptop. You see, like the crab got that laptop. And it's one of these cool Apple Silicon M1 things. And every time I get a new laptop, I run Hashcats benchmark to go, how much faster is this than the old laptop? I'm sure, like other people run games or something, but you know, Hashcat is what us hackers look at. Um, and it was much faster than my old one. I'm like, sweet. So then I ran my password cracking scripts against my old corpus of things, hoping that I could find new things that drop out. And it ran much, much slower. And I, I was like, boo, boo. So then I went onto the Hashcat um, GitHub, and there's this, this uh, issue there. It wasn't my issue, somebody else's issue. And if you look there, it's got 70 comments. Uh, this was way back in November 13. There's a whole bunch of people going, when Apple Silicon work? Why Apple Silicon slower? Things like that. Um, I like, genuinely tried to contribute to what the problem was. Like I did some hard computer science things to figure it out. And they had no idea what was going on. So they eventually just rewrote a whole new metal backend. Um, and I'll show you how well that worked. But basically, this was all born from the fact that I got a new laptop and Hashcat didn't work on it. So I thought, let, let, let's go play. The other thing was, I was having an argument with Leon about something. And I said, I bet you can make a purpose-built domain-specific tool really quickly and easily that'll be faster than the big general every use case tool. I think I was half right. Okay, so NTLM passwords, if we want to crack them, what does that look like? So the way NTLM works, and by the way, I really hate that it's called NTLM because there's LM hashes, and then technically these should be called NT hashes. And you get an NT hash and an, L, no, an LM hash and an NT hash, if any of you extract things from a domain, and that would like, make sense if it was called an LM NT hash, those things together. So why don't we just call the NT part an NT hash? So I just started calling it an NT hash, and then Microsoft people on Twitter were like, no, it's not called an NT hash, here's the documents. So it's called an NTLM hash, for no explainable reason. Okay, so the way an NTLM hash works is you take the clear text password, so in this case, password one, anyone wanna own up to that one? And that is bytes. So if we turn those into bytes, I mean, we don't turn it into bytes because it already is bytes, but the byte representation, the ASCII number, not the ASCII number, this is, this is a hex number. It is the hex number. Yes, okay. Performance anxiety. So the hex number is there. Okay, then NT hashes, you do have two operations, which is why they're so efficient to crack. The first is you UTF-16 little endian encoded. So what Hashcat did for ages is it just bodged in a null uh, after it. So there, 50 add a null, 61 add a null, 73 add a null. It's UTF, so there's other code points which aren't single width wide, so technically you could have like weird Cyrillic characters or kanji or things like that. But in this case, this is just kind of vanilla ASCII, so these are all nulls, so it just makes it wider. And then you, pr you do an MD4 operation on it. Okay, so to create an NT hash from a password, that's what we do. So then if we're cracking, uh, you take a small hash list, generally you don't have a giant hash list, or your password list is always gonna be more, like you wanna try a bajillion passwords against a million hashes. You're probably never gonna have a bajillion hashes against a million passwords, that would be weird. And you go through each hash in the hash list and you go through each word in the word list and you do this operation and if they match, then it's successful. So this isn't, like, this isn't a difficult computer science problem. This is, you know, do a thing and then check that it matches another thing and when they match, great. Okay, so I, I did that and it was like eight lines of code. And much like the initial permutation thing, it was really slow, and it was much slower than everything else. So then I went, I packed my crab backpack, and I went on an optimization journey. So these are some of the like, interesting optimizations, but that I, don't, I don't want to spend too much time on them. There's a blog post where I talk about them at the bottom there. Uh, so the one was, I, like if you look at smart crypto people, which I'm definitely not, I don't understand what they're doing half the time, it's all bit shift registers and things like that. Uh, they obviously have written a fast implementation. There's these Rust crypto people that have like formal verification methods. Um, but it turns out it actually wasn't too difficult to make their stuff run faster because I don't care about safety and all sorts of other things. So you can kind of ignorantly dive into 
well-defined implementations and make them less well-defined and more single-purpose to your thing and get some speed-ups. It's so like, don't be scared of trying to optimize people's libraries. Then the, the hash lookup problem, so you've got, you're generating hashes by going through your word list and then you want to check if any of the existing hashes you have match that. Right? Rather than taking a hash and going through the entire word list and taking another hash and going through the entire word list. Initially, I thought we could use B-trees because that's what databases use and that's quite efficient. So I implemented B-trees and those work quite well and I thought I was smart because, sound smart? Does it sound smart? Um, but then a friend pointed out to me that if you use a hash table, then that's actually much faster as you can just look up the thing. Uh, and then I worked out that, wait, these are already hashed. They're hashes. So you don't even need to hash them to put them in a hash table. You can use a no hash hasher and then you get a hash table without the cost of generating a hash table, with like very minor cost of generating a hash table. So that was pretty cool, got quite a lot of extra performance there. Uh, and then I implemented a shitty bloom filter. If anyone knows what a bloom filter is, you could explain it to me and then I could make it less shitty. Um, but basically just checks, particularly for small hash lists, like does the beginning byte even exist in the hash list that I have? If not, then let's exit early rather than going through the full operation. But at this point, everything I was doing was still slower than hashcat. Then I thought threading, and this was a terrible idea. Um, every standard technique I used was slower. Um, I had a, a very helpful conversation with like one of the authors of Rust who pointed out very kindly how this mistake I'm making is just like a really common mistake for beginners in Rust. And they actually, I'm not saying it's my, my fault, but they introduced something called scoped threads, probably just because of how irritating I was at pointing out the problems with their standard threading techniques. Um, but in the end, what, I, what worked out really well, and I didn't know, I'm still not 100% sure why this works, but most threading implementations will use channels. If you're familiar with Go, you know all about channels. Uh, and there, there will be a single receiver and lots of senders. So each of the threads are a sender, and they send it to the single receiver, which is in the main thread. Um, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have something reading passwords from a file and then sending them off to hashes, which would then do the comparison. So I, I built it the other way around. And the free benefit you get from using channels is you kind of get a queue. So then the threads can wait around if there's no work, and if there's lots of work, they can pick stuff off the, uh, the queue, which then means you can kind of monitor how efficiently you're using that queue, and it gives you a tuning, tuning parameter. So all of that stuff I thought was kind of cool and interesting. And in the end, with 150 lines of code, I was able to be much faster than Hashcat on a lot of things. So like the detail doesn't matter here, but what I did is the first one is anti-crack and the second one is hashcat. Anti-crack, hashcat, anti-crack, hashcat. Just anti-crack because hashcat took 10 minutes to do that one and then anti-crack, hashcat. And in all of those, if you're looking at that number there, anti-crack was faster than all of them. So I did the victory dance, I wrote a snotty tweet at Atom. <laughs> He's a really great guy and he does fantastic work. I don't really have beef with him. Um, and hashcat is still an infinitely better tool because it works on every piece of hardware in the world and it can do every hash. I wrote 150 lines of bad rust. So like, let's not overcook the, the real achievement here. But still, I was kind of chuffed. Anyway, I put it to bed, I was done. Then Matrix, who's the guy who actually implemented all of the Apple Silicon stuff on, um, in Hashcat, really nice guy despite the fact that he's Italian. No, I'm kidding, he really is a cool guy. <laughs> Um, and he does just like an amazing, you know, like all of these developers, they do all this amazing free work to contribute to this project, and I'm infinitely grateful to, to them. Uh, and he sent me this message. I've done some tests with much larger word, word lists, and I didn't get the math you blogged about. I was like, oh, he's probably running it wrong or something like that. Anyway, I checked, and he was absolutely right. The second we got to like over 10 gigs as a word list, then suddenly Hashcat was so much faster. I'm like, why? Why? Okay, how to read a file. If you go to the Rust handbook and you type in how to read a file, it tells you to do this. This is the exact thing that's on their web page. You get the file path and then you put the entire contents of the file in memory and now you have the file. So technically that's the one line there, fs read to string file path. Now that doesn't make sense if you've got like a 100 gig file, you don't have 100 gigs of RAM so you can't, you can't do that. So that's not going to work, you're going to have a bad time. Um, so. If you Google how do you read a file fast, in almost every language, there'll be some kind of buffered reader. So how do we make things go faster? We, thank you. Oh, this is, I'm gonna start a sports team. You guys are great. Okay, so the only code we've really changed here 
is we've added, so a block size, you've got to choose how big your buffer needs to be. Um, the trick is to just test for that, run it across a bunch of ranges, see which is the fastest. Uh, we create a buffer which is of the size of the block, and then we go through the file, dividing it by the block size, and we read just those blocks. Okay, so when you do that, it goes, it goes faster, because we have a buffer, much like the other. But then, no. Oh, there was an animation, look at that. That was a pointless animation. <laughs> I made a whole animation just to put ER on the end. Oh. Okay, so then this is a slide stolen from Halvar in that QCon talk of his, and he pointed out that like a lot of our assumptions about how we read from files are based on old, outdated ways of reading from files. How much time do I have left? Uh, and so what you're saying is modern NVMe SSDs have lots of internal parallelism, whereas old spinning Rust doesn't. So those of you who have a little more gray hair on the sides or a little less hair on the top will remember the days of hard drives, which was spinning Rust, uh, and you've got this like single read head, maybe if you like had two read heads. But what that meant is if it needs to read from a lot of places on the disk, it's got to spin it around to, to do that. So the way you read fast from disks is making sure that the data is next to each other and that you read it sequentially. And so you, like how the data was organized on the disk really matters. But like modern hard drives don't work that way, according to Halvar. What does he know? So I thought, let me test, because you can't take his word for anything. No, I'm kidding. This is, is this recorded? Oh. <laughs> Definitely getting in trouble. Um, so, so I thought, let me try threaded file reads then. I mean, this is like the universal wisdom that this is a bad idea. In the old days of having a head, it would have to read here and then jump over here. Everything would just go slower. Um, and so the, on the one hand, it's a little difficult to do it. Like, it wasn't obvious. You know, at first I had one file handle and tried to have lots of threads reading from it, but then eventually worked out, no, you need to have a separate file handle opened for each thread. Uh, but we implemented it. And let's check. Okay, so now we're going to run all of those different things we spoke about. We're going to just read from the file vanilla. We're going to um, add the buffer. And then we're going to do threaded file reads. So we're at 1.6 seconds for the vanilla. The buffer, we get to 358 milliseconds. And then threaded file reads are like half of that at 143 milliseconds. So it turns out that like, using threads goes faster on file reads. Who knew? Like, Halva, Halva. Um, but so this problem kind of related to the problem I was having with trying to make my shitty Rust code run faster than Hashcat. And um, the, it, when it came down to was hashing. So not hashing, caching. Now I've gone too slow. So DD, we're reading from a file. We're putting it to dev null at a certain block size. This is going to repeat. We'll see it again. And when we ran the first DD. Repeat, there we go. Uh, you can see the speed over there, 116. And then I'm using something called VM touch, which shows me the entire file exists within disk cache. I then evict it from the disk cache. I run it again, and you can see that's much slower, because I don't want it to repeat again, so particularly it's 57% slower. So the speed was coming from the fact that it was in the disk, disk cache. Um, and when we rerun the benchmark by evicting stuff from the disk cache, then threaded file reads are just as fast as the, the buffered one. So it's not necessarily the properties of the drive that are magic, or certainly it's not exposed at user space, it's happening in kernel space, it's the property of the file cache. So great, I will just cache the, the word list, and then my anti-crack will go faster, right? Because then it's cached. So if I cache a five gig file, that was fine, and things would go fast. That would be good. But like, that was the same size that I was using before and anyway, so it didn't prove anything. So this is a 110 gig file. And here you can see I ran VM touch, and it took 245 seconds, which is why I'm not going to make you wait through all of that despite previous demos. Um, and it shows that the entire thing is in the file cache. Great, except it's a lie, because your file cache isn't big enough to hold 110 gigs in there. So when you run it again, it actually shows that the last part is in the file cache. Now you can imagine from a password cracking perspective, that's super inefficient. It's basically sticking stuff into the cache after you've dealt with it, and you're never going to use it again. So it's caching in the wrong way. So there's all sorts of things you can do to try and figure out like, how to make that go faster. There's fadvise and mAdvise. Maybe you know what those things are. These are ways of trying to signal to the kernel how you're going to read the file to speed things up. None of those did anything. 
Um, and in the end, what I did is something I'm going to show you. Okay, so for a live demo, you have to sacrifice a chicken, which is why that crab is chasing a chicken, and I didn't sacrifice a chicken. And this needs to be bigger. And I need another one because I realized I closed the desktop where I had these demos set up on like an idiot. Okay, so I'm gonna run NT-crack and I'm gonna do it against a file called med, uh, which is 110, it's not, it's 10 gigs big. Okay, so if we use VM touch, uh, let's visual on med, you can see that part of the file is in is in the cache at the moment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna evict it, and now if you look at it, you can see nothing's in there. Now I wanna keep an eye, like a, my eye on what, uh, what is happening there. So if we go to med, we, I, I now wanna watch every second uh, what's sitting in the file cache. Now when I run NT-crack, you can see there's like a worm, that thing's going along caching chunks. So what I did is I just changed the behavior to cache the part that we're going to use and then evict it and cache the next part that we're going to use, which made things much faster. But the, one of the problems I had in trying to figure that out is how do you, how do you cache it? Because when you look at what I showed you here, if it's gonna take 245 seconds to cache the file, then that's gonna take a really long time, it's not fast. But if you look, remember this demo, when I ran DD, it would put the whole thing in cache and it would go through really fast. So it turns out you can just do a read and do nothing with it, and it'll put the thing in the cache, and that goes really fast. You do have to do things to tell the compiler not to optimize that out, because you're doing nothing with the read, but in doing that, sticks things in the cache, and then things go much faster. Uh, so after that, for large files, so this is a run against big, which is 110 gigs big, uh, it's 50% faster than Hashcat. So here you can see NT cracks at 109 seconds versus Hashcat's 258 seconds. The reason there are so many switches to Hashcat is because those are the things it uses for its, its benchmarking to try and make its stuff go faster. I also did warm-ups. Uh, I did a run there. Are there warm-ups? I don't see warm-ups in the screenshot. Anyway. Uh, so Hashcat will pre-cache. Uh, the first time you run it on a large word list, will cache it, and then subsequent runs are faster. I had already run that, so you're not getting those, those problems. It wasn't compiling any of its Hashcat kernels. That had already been compiled, so there's no artificial slowdowns in there. Um, and this demo, which I didn't close, or did I? Randomly resized. I can give you an idea of what that looks like. So on the left, we're gonna run Hashcat against med, and you can see it's not pre-caching anything, so it's gonna take about 24 seconds, uh, and at the same time, I'm gonna run NT-crack, because we might as well just make the CPU do more than it's supposed to at once, uh, and you can see 41% of that was already cached, so not the useful part, so it's going to evict that from the cache and then cache the bits that we actually need. You can see it's finished at 11 seconds while Hashcat's still going over here. So it's going through the same word list, finding the same, same things there. Uh, and this is the latest Hashcat. I pulled it earlier um, upstairs, so we're still faster. Now, this is a completely artificial test because the second you add any modifiers on that hashing, so if you're familiar with Hashcat, you can brute force things by like adding digits on the end, then that stuff gets really efficient and it makes the GPU burn. So I'm using Hashcat in the least efficient way and I'm comparing against that. So once again, Hashcat's amazing, people who develop it are amazing. Um, I'm using this really to kind of learn things about computers and how, how that stuff works, not trying to diss Hashcat. Uh, but then I thought, okay, this is kind of cool, I now have a seemingly an ability to deal with large files faster, and that's not a unique problem just to password cracking. Uh, it is also, for example, something you have with grep. So those of you who know what grep is, it's a way for searching files for uh, unique strings, let's just keep it simple. Um, and uh, if you work in security, particularly if you're on the blue side of things, you're often searching large files for strings a lot, and that time can take a lot of your life. So what we all do is we move to rip grep because it's much faster, also an amazing tool built by this guy named, um, actually I don't know what his name is, Andrew something, Burnt Sushi, only no nicks. Um, but rip grep's kind of like the gold standard for the fastest grep. So here is, um, I ported this technique over to grep, which I called sin grep, because singe and grep, you know. Um, and here's, so uh, it says anti-crack, no, there we go. 
sin grep, whoa, running against rip grep, and you can see rip grep takes 7.8 seconds, whereas sin grep is taking 3.5 seconds against um, that same file. And uh, did, oh, this is with warm up in the cache. So I was giving rip grep the opportunity to work on a cached file. So it had the same speed advantages as sin grep had. So this wasn't the, the file caching necessarily that was helping. Anyway, long story short, it turns out you can read files using threads much faster than, than doing these other things, um, and you can apply it to password cracking techniques. So really what I wanted to sh try and convince you of is that optimization can be fun, and it can be an interesting way of learning things about how computers work, how code works, uh, and there's no kind of stack limit here. You can deal in user space, you can deal in kernel space, you learn things about how your computer works, some point I'm reading kernel code to understand how Mac OS and Linux file caching are working, uh, and it's a great way to learn things. I'm also not suggesting you leave security to go into performance optimization. Uh, like, I think there's a world that exists for both, um, and I hope this was useful to you. Thank you. <laughs>